Good morning, Munich. I'm, uh, I'm very excited to be here today um, because, yeah, last year I was, uh, also had the pleasure to talk to you as well about um, Gartner's top 10 predictions, or the top five for that matter, because we only have 20 minutes today. <laughs> I would probably need an hour to talk to you about all of them. So um, yeah, today again, we'll talk about the latest predictions, um, the top five. And um, you might think, well, maybe um, some of the statements I'm gonna give you uh, in the next 20 minutes or so sound a bit unrealistic or, well, not gonna happen. But we do have a track record or we, we do check back how good we are with these predictions. So um, we, since 2010, we were about 75% correct in these cases. So we're doing pretty okay, I would say. So um, just for you, uh, some of you who may not be familiar so with our predictions, we publish them every year. They are the top statements or predictions, strategic um, forward-looking statements we make about the future, about the technology, how technology will impact us, uh, enterprises, and our private lives going forward in the next three to five years. So last year's theme was um, digital disruption, our predictions. So really, we, we called it, the future is a digital thing. So everything is gonna be digitalized and so on. Um, this year, the theme is probably the accelera acceleration of this, um, um, yeah, of, of what we're seeing as being a disruption um, all around. Um, what it means is that disruption has moved from being something that is infrequent and maybe inconvenient and sometimes to something that is, has become very frequent or a, a constant process, a constant um, change of, of things. So, and this acceleration basically also has a lot of, well, good but also negative consequences in, in some cases. So, because we cannot keep up with everything. So, one of the smaller predictions that are part of these larger predictions is that we're saying, or we're expecting that by 2010, uh, sorry, 2020, um, half of large enterprises worldwide will make business critical decisions based on faulty or out of date data. Because we can't keep up in many cases. So, we need to take a look at these mega trends and, and big um, predictions and trends. And um, I will talk to you to those five that I'm gonna discuss now in a second. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about how to recognize these trends, how to prioritize or what to prioritize and how to respond. So going right into the very first one and incidentally, the number one prediction of our top 10 predictions is right at the core of this very interesting conference here yesterday and today. So by 2020, 100 million consumers will shop in augmented reality worldwide. Well, maybe you might think, well, 100 million people, that is actually not that much. Um, if you think about that, we have, for example, 1.5 billion online shoppers today, and that number will grow to 2 billion in 2019. So yeah, compared to that, 100 million is not that big. But going from a very, very small base today, you will notice 100 million people in a few years. And why in retail, or why are we looking here at retail? Well, the retail, um, the, the retail area and the retail industry is changing. They're trying to reinvent themselves. Um, they are looking into finding new technologies and how to engage people. In some cases, this technology could be Bluetooth beacons to communicate with your shoppers. And we believe that augmented reality is a wonderful and, and really intriguing technology that will engage users. And we're already starting to see this being used in retail stores um, in, in many countries. So what we need to recognize here is that AR is, well, it all started with games, right? So we remember Pokemon, which was kind of a derivative of uh, augmented reality, I would say, um, last year. Um, but, and then another interesting event uh, a couple years ago when Apple bought Mateo and integrating this technology into iOS. I mean, iOS became basically, practically overnight almost, the largest AR platform for consumers. So bringing that to the masses was a very important step and this is how we, we see this will grow and this is one important driver. What we need to prioritize here is smartphones, tablets, head mount displays in that order because we believe that smartphones will be still the next or the most important platform for augmented reality in the next few years. 
at least for the next three to five years. And well, if you are in retail, you should deploy augmented reality, right? We were starting to see that already with larger retailers, with um, IKEA or Lowe's in, in, the, in the US. If you're, and if you're a developer, you're not retail, but you're a de developer, this is your chance, right? This is your chance to collaborate and be a partner to retailers worldwide to see how to implement this cool, really intriguing um, experience for, for users, to really change the user experience in retail. And the near-term flag for this um, prediction is that by year end 2018, so end of next year, smartphones will still drive 90% of all AR experiences. So maybe some of you were in Berlin last year and I talked to you about the rise of the robots. So the robots that will be hiring or firing people or write a lot of content. So yes, we still talk about that robots or machines will be able to write a lot of content um, autonomously. Um, they can analyze databases, take out the relevant information, reason, and generate content. And you will not be able to distinguish anymore if that content was written by a person or a machine. And then in the end, distributed, if it's a news report, maybe to the public, or if it's an internal report in an organization to employees. So, this is what, what we're seeing is already happening today. But today I also want to talk to you, not about those robots, but I want to talk to you about bots. That's the next prediction. And I'm gonna talk about the good bots this time. So I know there's you know, negative things like bad bots, but we're, we're gonna talk about the good, good, good bots uh, here. But before we go into this, um, I wanted to ask, how many times do you think you interact or touch your phone every day, during a day, average day. 50 times, 100 times maybe? Yeah. So according to our very recent um, study with millennials um, that we just closed a month ago, we asked millennials in the UK, in Germany, and in the US um, how often they interact with their phone. We tested that, and it's about 180 times per day that they interact or touch their phone. So yes, we're very attached to our phones, definitely. And, yeah, this is a little sad picture, but um, yeah, another smaller prediction within the larger predictions here that we're gonna talk probably more with bots at some point than with our spouses. Um, those little programs, those bots, those chat bots, but also the bots that we can actually verbally talk to and, and um, vocally uh, express what we want and what we need um, with Siri and Cortana and, and so on and so on. Those are becoming more and more sophisticated. They're very basic at this time, but they are starting to understand who they're talking to. They will, in a few years, understand what emotional state I will be in or I am in that moment. So they will understand more and more what we want and need. And this is going to be one of the biggest impacts um, in the next few years. So this is the second prediction. By 2020, 30% of web browsing sessions will be done without a screen. So really think about voice first in the next few years. Um, conversa conversational sy systems are going to be one of the key technologies that we see in the next few years that will grow, as I said, that will become more sophisticated, understand better, and so on. And um, what we need to prioritize here is, you know, as I said, conversational systems. The conversational experience is what we're seeing will grow and, and build out, and bot interactions, and of course, everything that makes that possible is machine learning. So prioritizing and investing in machine learning is what everyone at the moment, or some of the largest vendors in this space are doing, obviously. And we also see, um, we will see quite a bit of pressure also on enterprise organizations to introduce these conversational experiences inside the organizations, because that's the next generation of technology, of, of employee and employer um, exp experience we will see in the next few years. So at the moment, we're still very much at the beginning, as I said. They're still very simple, simplistic, those kind of systems that um, the industry needs to build right now um, cases and um, offer APIs for developers. So um, we, yeah, we, at the moment, we, we still are at the stage of um, more building cases than anything else. The near-term flag is that by end of this year already, 5% of consumer-facing websites will have voice-enabled uh, chatbots, and we're getting quite close to that number. Without much um, further introduction, I'm going right into the next one, which talks about the Internet of Things. 
So by 2022, the IoT will save consumers and businesses in the range of one trillion US dollar per year. So how do we get to this crazy number? <laughs> we um, do a lot of enterprise service as well um, during the year, and um, we talk to a lot of IT users who already have implemented very successful IoT projects. And we're, we have identified here some um, high value assets that, um, well, the, the, those are the, the, five, the, five, the top five um, high value assets that um, you can, or that are there to, um, to leverage, especially IoT implementations um, for maintenance, for example. And um, here you can see what the savings are for these top five high value assets. You can see that the balance is 0 0.8 two trillion, so the, the difference between that and the trillion is um, small opportunities and the consumer part of this. What we need to recognize here is that we're gonna move with the Internet of Things to what we call preventive maintenance, mainly today, to predictive maintenance. So preventive maintenance is a simple kind of IoT implementation where I have a little sensor and the sensor tells me at some point, um, well, I'm th this, this a machine needs something and I need a technician coming out. Predictive maintenance involves something that is called a digital twin. Um, we've quite a bit of research around this, and you probably have heard of it as well, um, what digital twins are. It's a digital representation of a physical machine or object. And with these digital twins, we are able to have predictive maintenance because I can actually inspect, for example, this, this digital twin ex instead in the place of the physical object. So makes things easier, and I can also see, which is most important, real-time information. I know the re in real-time what that physical object state at the moment is. And that brings us more um, savings than the preventive maintenance. So what we need to prioritize are the expensive assets, as I said before, and yeah, we need to use, or organizations need to invest in digital twins. We are already seeing quite a few of our clients, um, large clients who already have over 50 different digital twins for um, their different operations. And so the near-term flag is that by 2020, we'll see a fleet of organizations using those digital twins to achieve those um, savings. So shifting gear a little bit to a different, more consumer-oriented uh, uh, topic with the next prediction, with number four, um, let's talk about the digital giants. Um, in terms of market capitalization, those are the seven giants, Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent, Facebook, Amazon, Google, and Apple. And well, they're everywhere, right? I mean, they're already everywhere in our lives when we're you know, working out or at home in our connected home experience, when we go shopping or just out for coffee. So they have a huge impact already in many, um, how, how, they, how we interact with them or how many inter interactions we have with them. So we're predicting that by 2021, 20% of all activities in which an individual engages will involve at least one of the top seven digital giants. I think the secret that we probably, or it's not a secret <laughs> apparently, but one of the secret sources for, for all of these, um, for these three, or these seven um, um, giants is, is for sure that they have so much data about us or they're collecting or they're in, in the process of collecting so much data and they're digitalizing all the different processes and services um, they're offering that this is power. Dig obviously, data is, is power. And um, in a few years when maybe um, Apple uh, HomeKit is, is installed everywhere, Apple knows which part of the city at what time everybody's cooking, and what do they do with that information? Um, they might go to the utility company and say, here, look, this is what's happening. And certainly, most certainly, this kind of information goes back right into the product and makes it better. So those are the giants, and prioritize, make it digital, make it programmable, and make it smart. And here comes the part of the, about cheap machine learning again and uh, artificial intelligence, all of these giants as well as uh, their competitors are working on uh, making or enhancing services, making them smarter, making, making them better with machine learning. And well, I guess I think we, we have to collaborate or most of us here in this room will have to collaborate with these giants. Unless you are a gorilla yourself and you feel you can compete, 
in with these giants. But in general, we all have to lock in to their systems, to their ecosystems uh, and platforms to create value. A near-term flag is by end of next year, we'll have at least two digital giant brands per household. It's a huge number if we think about it, how many households there are in the world. So gearing up to the last one of today, number five, um, last year I also talked to you uh, a little bit about uh, wearables and how wearables will become in some areas mandatory um, in, in organizations. For example, for safety purposes, there are already some wearables being used to um, measure fatigue levels for drivers, for example, and so on, but also for um, just other organizational purposes or just to support a health program, for example. Um, that people are wearing fitness trackers. So this year, we're taking this a little step further and we're saying by 2020, 40% of employees can cut their healthcare costs by wearing a fitness tracker. So we all know, unfortunately, the, yeah, the sad statistic or the little unsettling statistics that we should do more, you know, we should do more workout and, you know, we're all unfit, we need to be healthy and so on. So obviously this is, this is a pr problem that we have everywhere in the world, um, probably in this room as well as, you know, if we go to other countries anywhere, we um, see those statistics that we are at higher risk, 30% higher risk, um, that's what the World Trade, uh, well, sorry, World Health Organization is saying about um, the, the increased risk level that you have when you are not working out in place of, um, yeah, working out. So what we are seeing is that a lot of organizations are prioritizing this and um, with, with corporate health programs. So sponsoring fitness programs, sponsoring wearing a fitness wearable to create a win-win-win situation, as I would say. So you can cut healthcare costs for the user, you can cut overall healthcare costs as well because people get uh, less sick and also the employer has uh, great benefit because you know you have people that are less often sick so these kind of programs are definitely still very strongly focused on the u.s market where we're seeing this more and more talk to clients all, all around the world um, talk to clients healthcare organizations in australia recently southeast asia and also in europe and it's coming to many parts of this world and that's why we have um, calculated this business case so yeah, as a response, provide wellness programs and um, supporting fitness trackers is, is a big trend in many organizations today. A near-term flag is that by the end of this year, 70% of multinational corporate sponsors, co corporations sponsor the use of wearable fitness tracking devices. So um, we're very close to that number already. So I hope this was interesting and a little inspiring of what the mega trends are apart from augmented reality and virtual reality as we've been talking here the last two days about um, most of the time. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I will be kicked off the stage here in a few seconds. So um, please uh, come to me, find me maybe for coffee and uh, so I can maybe answer some questions as well. Thank you.